All right, welcome back to Twin Flame Energy Podcast. This is AJ. <laughs> <laughs> and I am your co-host, Dominique, and we are live streaming on Twitch. This is podcast number 14, and the title of today's podcast is Reflections Part 2. Part how two. I See You, or for those out there, How Do You See Your Spouse? hmm so let's get right into it. Phones on silent. <laughs> Don't know if mine is, but it is what it is. So the first article is coming from psychologytoday.com. The title of this article is, How Do You View Your Partner? Mm-hmm. So each of us holds opinions about the people around us. These are developed from what we observe and remember of their strengths and weaknesses. We generally stick to a salient memory. One, mm-hmm. th- ones that are the most noteworthy or personally mean- meaningful from those memories we develop what is referred to our global perspective, which is the way we simplify the world. <laughs> we think of them in very broad terms. Yeah. We might come to classify some people as caring about others, some can't be trusted, that one's a snob, and so forth. Right. So my question is, do you think you have created a global perspective or, I guess, preconceived notions about me, and are they fair? I don't... That that global perspective thing, like, I absolutely just, like... I actually hate the idea of a global perspective perspective because it's really not how you perceive things how you feel and how you think about certain things so i don't feel like i've i don't really go by that i just know i go by she makes me happy she does these things for me this feels right and you know what i mean sometimes it changes sometimes you feel a little bit different but global perspective will stay the same Mm -hmm. you know what i mean it'll just it's just a perspective. It's the way that they tell you that things are supposed to be. And I just, I don't know. I just don't, I don't really get with that. I guess, I mean, I can say I have created a global perspective about you. Mm-hmm. And I know it doesn't necessarily line up with who you want to be mm-hmm. or who you are coming across as or mm-hmm. like who you are at your core. Let me say that. Okay. Because who I think you are at your core is some is a way different from who sometimes I think I perceive you as from a global perspective. Okay. Because I think a lot of times a person can be one way at their core, but due to circumstances, due to how they're feeling, mm-hmm. due to you know just so many different outside influences that can change kind of how you interact with other people, no. but it may not ring true to who you are at your core right and so for and me i think i've created a global perspective just from what i perceive you as however i do mm. set that apart from who i think you are at your core or who you want to be okay. if you catch my drift kind of yeah I, I think i know what you're saying like for example you may may be a certain way when you're stressed but when you're not stressed you are completely the best different. version of yourself so it's like yeah. yeah we all have a we all have a a day you know what i mean yeah and, and or it could uh, be a year or it could be a 10 years but it could be just all because of going through something life. where you're not at your best yeah life happens. and it just certain you know it just affects how right. you come off to everyone else right So, we also use our global perspective to make prediction as how people will react to different situations. And we also attribute motivations and and, uh, intentions behind what they do and say. If we think a person is dishonest, he or she might be the first one who, who becomes to mind if something is missing. If we believe a person is only out for themselves... We're skeptical that any act of kindness has a ulterior uh, and self-serving motive. From our global perspective, we apply what is known as sediment override. Essentially, this is a filter we use to intercept 
events according to the general perspective. We develop we developed um if we like a person we'll cut them some slack when we attribute reasons for their actions or we'll focus on factors that justify their behavior even if we disapprove of that behavior but if we hold a negative uh, global perspective we use our overriding sentiment to judge that person's behavior and their motives as negative <laughs> if they do something good we're pretty sure they have an ulterior motive that that aren't so good or we might accept that they've done uh what they've done as positive but still it's not at all uh indicative of who they really are so so the question would be if every day is a new opportunity for change how can we allow for people to change our global view or perspective of them? I think it's about repetition. I think that people look too often for a freaking cookie because they did something one time and that just doesn't cut it. If you do something for five years and then you do something for three months, that that's not equal. I'm not saying you have to do it for five years, but it'll take maybe a year for somebody to be like, okay, maybe that old person is gone. And so it's kind of a situation where it's like, you know, if every time, every time you say a word, you say it one way Mm -hmm. and you're trying to like tell yourself to say it a different way. It becomes a thing where every time that word comes up, you take a pause first you know, a lot of times there's a thing of, you know, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But at the same time, when you want to change a specific behavior, it mm-hmm. becomes the forefront of your mind. So if you want to change how somebody sees you in a specific area, it becomes your number one goal. And so you work so hard for that, mm-hmm. that it's a situation where it's like you don't do it one time and then three months you fall off. And then you're like, yeah, but I'm. Don't you see? I'm trying. That I think that's crap. You have to do something perpetually, over and over again, in a totally different manner, in order to completely change how somebody sees you. And until somebody does that, there there cannot be change to the global perspective or how they're perceived. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So. Global perspectives are important in marriage because they can affect the quality and the path it takes. What a positive (gasps) bias towards our spouse, with a positive bias, there goes my mic, towards our spouse, we're more prone to attribute good motives and intentions to their actions. Mm -hmm. And we believe um, they have our best interests in mind. The result is we treat our partners well And that makes them feel good. Then they adopt positive attitudes towards us and are more disposed to treat us well. That further reinforces our own positive bias. A negative global perspective, on the other hand, leads to negative treatment. And that causes the other person to be negative and hostile towards us, which we then repay with more negativity. These couples tend to argue more. They don't do it Productively, Mm -hmm. because their arguments are really about their views of each other and personal shortcomings that are less related to a specific situation or events. A negative bias can bring down a marriage when we primarily focus on our partner's personal shortcomings or their instability to satisfy our expectations. Neither partner is happy. We're not happy because our partner isn't what we want them to be. Uh, They're not happy because they know we don't regard them favorably. And hence, they won't have much for us. A major problem with chronic negative bias is the tendency to ruminate. We can become obsessed with the faults we see in our partner to the point of constantly reviewing them in our minds. When we become preoccupied with such thoughts, we can get looked into, uh, uh, into a cycle of negativity. Uh, ruminating fuels itself. 
meaning that each negative thoughts or emotion causes other ones to pop up in our mind and then another and so on and that chain reaction of negativity can uh be hard to break actually um so the question is how do you think this negative global perspective affects our relationship there goes moon she escaped um (laughs) i think it definitely does I think we have these types of conversations. We've had we had a meeting in today. I think that I don't know. Sometimes there can be a disconnect. Like you may be thinking that something is the most important thing to you and that you're working on it, but I am obsessed with action. I've become it's become obsessive for me. So my thing is if I can't see an action, I don't think something exists. So even though you may be plotting in your head or thinking about something all the time because I can't see your thoughts and there isn't something that has taken fruition here in the 3D land, I feel like it doesn't matter to you at all. And so that will view my negative bias towards you and then I automatically respond negatively towards you and then you feel attacked and you come back negative at me and then it's just a cycle of negativity. Right. So that's how I think it affects us right. specifically. You know? Mm-hmm. I get it. So it is important to keep in mind that global perspectives can change for the better and for the worse. If you can think more positively of your partner, he or she is likely to feel and think better about you. However, you should always always keep in mind that if your spouse thinks highly of you and your behavior doesn't justify it or your bias is negative, you will eventually be demoted. <laughs> Bad behaviors and attitudes will be executed once in a while, but not forever. <laughs> so the second article comes from uh insider.com www.insider.com the title of the article is 10 signs you don't know your partner as well as you think you do (laughs) so number one you've never met their friends (laughs) two they have a lot of hobbies and interests that don't include you uh number three they don't talk about their upbringing four You're never faced with a major crisis together. Five, you never disagree. Six, you don't know how they spend their money. (laughs) Seven, you don't know their specific plans for the future. Number eight, you never talk about big issues. Number nine, they don't pick up on your emotional cues. Number 10, you think your partner is perfect. (laughs) So the question is, How do you think we measure up to this list? Out of all 10 of these, Mm -hmm. number seven and number nine, we clobber the rest of them. Number seven, you don't know your, their specific plans for the future. I don't know your specific plans for the future. And we don't really have really good conversations about that because you're not a direct person. I'm extremely direct and you are not. And so that I think you feel that you're direct, but I don't feel like you are direct. I think what in God's name does that even mean? Yeah, I think I can say, hey, in the next two years, I'm going to do this, this, this and this. That's the definition of direct. I say, what do you want for the next two years? I mean, you know, we just be enjoying each other and (laughs) having family time. You know, we play games. And what is that? You you don't have any. You've never been like, hey, in the next two years, I want to see this growth that that's the definition of direct. How can you tell me I'm not direct? If you ask me well, right now, what is my two-year plan? Ask me. No, I mean. Don't ask me. No, I'm not. I'm oh, not oh, talking about that. Okay. I mean, that I'm, is. Uh, that's what I. Don't, I listen. I, I it was says talking about you don't know their specific else. plans for the future. Mm-hmm. We're talking about just that. Okay. So yeah. you can't tell me I'm not direct. Okay. I, I I I spit out my plans all day long. I'll give you that. I do not know. I don't know what you want next week, let alone for the future. And number nine, they don't pick up on your social cues. I don't think you're good at that either. Mm. Okay. You have thoughts about this list? 
Um, no, I mean, I, yeah, I think we're pretty solid on the list. Yeah. And moving on to article lovely number three. It comes from www.yourtango.com. The title of this article is For a Better Marriage, Learn How to See Your Spouse. One of the ways we get tripped up in communicating our needs to our partners is by expecting them to be, well, expecting them to be mind readers. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying to your partner, if you love me, you'll just know what I need from you. Say, I know we don't think exactly alike, so let me tell you exactly what's on my mind. Mm. As much as we expect men to yeah. understand us, we also need to understand them. The number one secret to a good relationship seeing him for who he is rather than who you want him to be. The following tips will bring out the man you fell in love with and who there, who is there to support you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Toss the illusion and get real. Don't expect him to have some makeup version of who you'd like him to be. See him for who he is. Focus on his strengths, not his weaknesses. Express your top three needs, not 20. Mm -hmm. Express them clearly and kindly. Express why you need what you need and know your bottom line. He won't know unless you tell him. Choose being happy over being right. Mm -hmm. When you focus on being right, it stops you from being open-minded and working with your partner and finding a solution to a problem or working towards a common goal. Be willing to be flexible and compromise. Shut up and listen. Effective conversation involves listening more, talking less. When you and your husband are in a conversation, focus on listening. Really listen to what he has to say instead of focusing on the next right thing you want to say. Mm -hmm. Take a deep breath and think before you speak. Lighten up. If you really want to be heard, lower the level of your intensity and lighten up. Ask more questions instead of being bossy. Relationships are a give and take, and a good sense of humor is a must. Mm. Mm. And one more. Compliment more, criticize less, enough said. Speak to him the way you'd like to be spoken to. Mm. I go for more, speak to him the way you would want to be spoken to if you were doing what he does. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I feel that I'm a, I'm a deep oh, advocate Lord. for giving people exactly what they deserve and what I feel like I would deserve if I was doing what that other person was doing but then that then that's that's what this whole article was saying is that you're no, not gonna not. get what you want hey if you do that you're not gonna get what you want no that's not what this says I mean if you sum it up here's an example express your top three needs not 20 I can give you top three. Okay. That is, those are the three that I can't have. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is we're going to enjoy this quick music break, and we will be back in a moment.
change I can feel it through my veins Rise of bourbon ceases we first fell And to separate would be like hell Let the devil drink and blow the name from the break and that song is entitled the you in you by vapors ever so fitting and available everywhere you choose to stream your music man say that slow the you in you okay just had, just had to let that soak you in. know or you don't know just, just had to let that soak in <laughs> <laughs> so now it is time for the book of the month dun, 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 dun. All right. So, so this <laughs> month, this month's book is Married Roommates: How to Go from a Relationship That Just Survives to a Marriage Marriage That Thrives. We will be chatting about Chapter Two, Part One: Marriage, The Missing Owners Manual. Chapter Two: Life's Three Acts. So let's dive in. And I'm super excited about this. One thing I did is I pre-wrote a bunch of podcasts. So I literally have not even looked back at this chapter since before the new year. But I've been like dying to get on here to talk about this. Because Mm -hmm. this chapter was bomb.com. So let's start with romanticizing marriage. When it comes down to some of the more predictable challenges of marriage, society does not 
do its part of preparing us for the road to come. Mm -hmm. As a culture, we tend to romanticize the wedding process, glossing over the often unmarketable realities of marriage. We usually don't talk about what happens after the honeymoon, when life gets real and you must figure out how to braid two individual outlooks and mindsets into a harmonious adult life. Young couples get married for the first time, usually don't talk about the challenges of maintaining love and a connection through years among all the twists and turns that life brings. This lack of insight leaves us many going into major life changes, ill-equipped and unprepared for the difficulties ahead. As a result, many will have a hard time adjusting. So the three acts are loose expectations of where one should be at any given point in life based on healthy development stages that adhere to the societal norms. Your 20-year-old self should be quite different from your 40-year-old self in a way that you act and behave in your goals and lifestyles. But will these changes just occur naturally? Do you just organically evolve and mature to meet these unspoken expectations of life? Or must you... uh, uh, (laughs) Or must you actually take steps to facilitate this growth? So, will the 45-year-old dad accept and understand that his insistence... (laughs) I have to say something first, okay? Because this is going to sound so ridiculous Mm -hmm. as you let up our crabmatic adjustable bed. Yes, this is an old moment. I told the world. Old moment. Old moment. What is if you heard, mm, no, it's our crabmatic adjustable. So we see what is, active life we're in. What <laughs> are you talking about? <laughs> that was an old people moment. He was letting up the bed. So anyways, yes, we podcast while in bed. So <laughs> what I was trying to say is what I'm about to read is going to sound completely loaded. I will tell you this okay. in advance. This came straight from the book. Okay. I did not make this up. Okay, so don't come at me sideways. Okay. Please. Are you ready? Okay. Will the 45-year-old dad accept and understand that his insistence on being a night owl is now costing him and his family his much-needed strength, clarity, and patience? When he wakes up late, strolls in the kitchen grumpy, Is he able to connect the dots to his wife's subsequent nagging and disapproving looks? Or does he just find a way to rationalize his behavior to himself? Mm. Then he says, what about the wife who, along with her husband, owns a profitable business and loves their comfortable lifestyle, but refuses to learn anything about financing and money management because it's too hard? And how about the guy who refuses to give up on buying parts for his toys, such as cars, although it means struggling financially, or the mom who will not interchange, entertain changing her style of dressing sexily, despite <laughs> it being an embarrassment to her kids and her husband. Mm. I found all that to be really interesting, but go ahead. <laughs> so, the first act. Act one. Sees you through early ch- uh, adult, I said childhood, <laughs> adulthood, moving from being a dependent to self-reliance and independent. This era of characterize- characterized by, is characterized by important personal achievements, uh, experimentation and uncertainty. For many, it is a time of complete self absor Absorption and self-discovery during which you learn to become more comfortable in your own skin. Act one generally gives you the space and freedom to develop your individual individuality. Living on your own, college, first jobs that morph into careers and coupling up in mature relationships characterize the act's major milestones during this time the focus is on yourself and in accordance your reality and behavior 
are shaped through the lens of yourself as a self-driven individual entity. If you missed the opportunity in Act 1, you may have to wait a long time until, you, you're, until the responsibilities of Act 2 fade out. For those dreams to become a reality again, some opportunities may be lost to you forever, such as sowing your wild oats before marriage. And you may just have to wait to, to accept that you missed the boat and do so without lingering resentments. Mm. The duo of Act Two. Act Two officially kicks off when you commit to a life of we instead of me. Pairing up, you choose to go through life, life's adventures alongside a partner. And whether or not, or whether married or not, in Act Two, you share life with another. This can be tough, a tough transition where you are all of a sudden expected to go from making choices for and by yourself to now having to compromise. Find middle ground and share all elements of your life with one another. Couples are often not prepared for stressors and difficulties that accompany life's major accomplishments in Act 2. Getting married, having kids, having more kids, moving to a bigger house, and advancing in their career. All ultimately create greater expectations and more responsibilities that you do not have the infrastructure to support. Since you are all still operating with the insight and habits of Act 1, which now come up significantly short, the reasons often fail to manage these increased demands in life and in your relationship more uh, has more to do with your instability uh, and an inability to uh, anticipate and change expectations and or behaviors accordingly than your inability to do so. It is as if the treadmill you were running on just sped up and failing to adjust your speed accordingly, you fall. If you knew that the pace was about to change, you would have to be ready for it. The insight that in Act 2, every part of your life will change, and that is normal, eludes us. So would you say that that I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say, going from Act One to Act Two. Do you think you were ready for Act Two, or aware of what Act Two would expect of you? No. <laughs> I can say I agree with you. I think I was. However, I because you just like. Miss Perfect. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm kidding. However, this is where I toggle. You know what? Drink some water. It's going to be okay. Hmm? Drink some water. Oh. Yeah, she got me reading like uh, a million pages. You're going to be okay. Drink some water. My Anyways, throat is a little dry. I see myself. First of all, I didn't get a chance to act one. Mm-hmm. And I, that really bothers me. But I think it only bothers me because I want to be flowing more in Act 2. And I feel like because our wants and needs and desires have not completely aligned mm -hmm. the way that they need to, we have, are struggling in Act 2. So because we're struggling in Act 2, it actually diverts me and makes me miss Act 1 instead of being happy in Act 2 because mm -hmm. Act 2 can become miserable for me. And so I start thinking about the act two that never, I mean, the act one that never was. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Of course. Whereas if we could get aligned in act two and I can see true progress in the partnership of act two, I could be totally in it and love it. You know what I'm saying? Right. So 
Every moment now seems to have multiple demands placed on it. But instead of working as a team, you split the load. You end up going at it alone, which just makes it harder. By doing so, you eliminate more and more of what you need to support one another to meet these increasing demands. You spend less time together, less time alone with or with less time alone or with friends. You stop doing what makes you happy. You eliminate hobbies and other avenues of self-care now are now seen as luxuries. You cancel the monthly get together with your friends at basketball court or golf range. There is no more yoga, playing pool, or lunches with your lunches at your favorite restaurants. But by eliminating these, you cut out most of the fun and joy out of your life. As I turn the page. Mm-hmm. Act three. <laughs> this is for my parents. A time of optimism or hopelessness. What? No, act three is just after the kids have left the house. That's why I said oh, for our parents. You... Oh, okay. But it, it says optimism or hopelessness. Oh, okay. Silly. Act three can play out like those. But act three can play out those. I can't see. Act Three can play out like those choose. Oh, I don't know what's written here. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get this right. Act three can play out like those choose your own adventure book. We're here, depending on the. I don't know what that means. On the choices you make, you get one of these two endings. Okay, we're just gonna start here. Mm-hmm. This can be the time of great happiness for a couple. Or a time of deep sorrow as realizations may lead to separation and divorce. Ideally, if a couple is able to hold on to each other through the hardships of an earlier, more challenging time with mutual respect, communication, and love, Act 3 is where you enjoy and reap the rewards. That's why I said parents. Life slows down with fewer responsibilities and Mm -hmm. fewer balls to juggle. The kids are now grown, most likely at college or living off their adult lives. Mm -hmm. Their demands on your life are minimal, sometimes. Employment should be ramping down, leading towards time of reduced workload and or retirement. That means more time on your hands to do what you love. If you cherish your relationship and nourished it through the years, it will be there intact in Act 3. Together, Mm -hmm. we will get to enjoy the fruits of our labor. You get to enjoy your grown children without having to discipline. Perhaps there are even grandchildren down the road. You get to appreciate the time you have together and the money that you will hopefully have saved to go on to build your dream together. So, getting to the fix. Regardless of the active life you may be in, it is not too late to correct your course. Whatever neglect, resentment, or stagnation has taken root in your marriage is fixable. It's time to learn to communicate with one another in a way that actually works. Mm -hmm. And there is a way, believe us, that the two-pronged approach of removing bad and rebuilding good. Many couples come to therapy when their house life becomes intolerable. They work on removing the bad and the environment at home improves. Some erroneously believe that this lack of bad is good enough and do not continue to work to rebuild the good, which robs them of the potential of soaring to new heights in their marriage. We encourage couples to use the two-prong approach to avoid settling for just good enough in their marriage. Hmm. So, chapter two takeaways. So, the first one is society often glosses over the unmarkable unmarketable elements of marriage choosing to focus on its shinier or more romantic aspects the romanticizing of marriage work against young couples who inevitably spend their time and resources now on efforts that will not serve them down the line or down the road uh two would be the lack of insight leaves many going into a major change uh, life change, ill-equipped, and underprepared for the difficulties ahead. As a result, many will have a hard time adjusting. Third one, couples are often not aware of the uh, intricacies involved in the higher level of adulthood. 
it is then easy to blame it on each other, to have resentments toward who has it easier and to get caught up in problems rather than look at the solutions. Uh, uh, The fourth one. I'm like losing my count. <laughs> Act two means life, living a shared life where you now must function as a duo. This requires you to work together to make decisions and choices that propel you forward. And the last one, or the fifth one, uh, there must be a massive mental shift for partners to have the ability and tools to make it through this time of life intact as a team just getting married without having this awareness can easily set you up for failure so you can prepare for predictable changes and you may have to accept the aspects of your life that no longer fit into this act Mm -hmm. it is easy to personalize the hardships of act two Mm -hmm. and blame each other society may reflect back to you that you are the ones struggling that this is not the reality in many homes and it has become your personal problem rather than a a systematic one. Mm -hmm. Technology can mask the problem of your marriage, working along with your bad habits to keep you away from one another in avoidance and mindless exhaustion. Couples get stuck and assume that a lot of this behavior is normal and that the distance they feel from each other is temporary. The years could pass, filling with buffers and distractions, but one day those will dwindle and come to stop, and you will be forced to face each other in the relationship you created. It's never too late. Even those in Act 3 can find their way back to each other. You do not have to settle for good enough marriage. Use the two-prong approach of fixing your connection. Learn to work to remove the bad and rebuild the good. So th- the next week we will be reviewing chapter three. It is called Where Did We Go Wrong? <coughs> mm-hmm. If you are following along with us, you will be reviewing one chapter a week. That gives us all obviously a lot of time to digest and reflect on the information that we have received. Moon literally almost unplugged everything. Yeah, I, I was kind of getting that feeling. <laughs> like she I was like, the, oh, 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 I'm going to get it this time. I'm going to get it. <laughs> like, oh, well, that cuts this week's podcast <laughs> short. <laughs> but all right, it's time for pick a card, any card. I don't know why that song. I don't know why that every time. <laughs> You have a thing for that uh, that show? Yeah, I guess so. We have switched up the deck again this week, and we will be pulling from the and <laughs> long-term couples edition cards. They are black in color for coding purposes. And the cards will we, uh, that we have picked for this week are... All right. So the first card, I picked the first one off the top. Mm-hmm. What, this is an interesting card, what is the hardest thing you've forgiven me for? Or have I done that yet? (laughs) That's my exact same response, dude. Uh, I have the same response. mm -hmm. My response is deep, though, too. I mean, I don't... I I can answer it. I can answer it with the hardest thing I will ever forgive you for one day. I can answer it like that. Okay. The hardest thing I will ever forgive you for one day is from my perspective, depriving Mm. me and your kids of the best version of you. Mm. Your turn. I mean, I, you know, I'm supposed to come after that. Don't, don't be mad because I I think. I mean, you just be just just just. Be mad because I be thinking. I ain't thinking. It's just laying stuff on all thick. <laughs> Listen, I'm a thick I'm a thick brained person. Oh, that's no. Stop it. <laughs> but yeah. You have to respond okay. to the card, dude. Well, I did. No, you didn't. I said I don't. I don't. 
I don't. Um, I didn't say what I have forgiven you for. I said I will forgive you one day. You're not forgiven. Forgiveness requires something to be different. I mean, you, you, you're asking from my response. From though. your perspective, what is the hardest thing you've forgiven me for or will one day have to forgive me for? The hardest thing. I mean, I, I have to. That's what I'm saying. I don't. I have to you think. Don't know. I have to. Do you know how many I, podcasts I have we have started with you answering the question from last week because you can never come up with a response? It is so annoying. Everyone. I need you to think more. It'll be good for all of us. Is, is that your? Is that your? <clears throat> I was burping. Final answer. Is yeah. that your final answer? Yep. Okay. Well. So that does it for this week's podcast. We will be back streaming live on Twitch next week at 10 p.m. Hopefully in a minute it's going to be 830 because we are old people and we had to take a nap from 8 to 930 in order to make it to this podcast. It was very, very rough. No, we set alarms on Google. She woke us up at nine and then 915 and then 930. It really happened exactly this way. See, I feel like we're already in Act Three, aren't we? <laughs> you wake her up from a nap. She is like. Listen, naps are a devil. She is. She is like. Naps angry. are a satanic she thing. She hates. Yes, when I if if I get awakened from a nap, I want death to all. That's how like it, she it's is, the most excruciating feeling. Oh my god! I feel like I need to like harm things. So that's why I don't take naps. I just go in. But the I was cave. so sleepy. We were watching Thousand Pound Sisters, and I just started to falling asleep. But that's a, a story for another day. Mm-mm. So, as I was saying, Mm-mm. we will be back next week streaming live on Twitch. All of the articles used to drive today's discussion for it can be found in the description box, as well as links to the book of the month, How to Be an Adult in Relationships, The Five Keys. Mm-hmm. What the heck am I saying? I'm reading, but that is not the damn book. What? So this is a typo in my notes. I'm very upset with myself. Let's rewind that back. Where the hell is the page? Wait. Here we go. Book of the month is Married Roommates. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) How to go from a relationship that just survives to a marriage that thrives. Yep. Yep, that really happened. I've got to fix my notes. But thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. Check out our Instagram at TwinFlameEnergy11 to find out next week's podcast discussion topic. That'll be posted probably in a couple of days, probably Sunday. Um, We will see you next week. Be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe, and of course, ignite your energy. energy.